Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 205 of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mysterious Isdal woman. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1970, a professor and his daughters were hiking in a valley near Bergen, Norway. They came across the remains of a woman in the woods, and she had died a gruesome death. Known only as the Isdal woman, the authorities discovered that she had a very mysterious past and may have been a spy. Her death touched off an international investigation and a mystery that remains to this day. It's the greatest unsolved murder in Norway and the greatest Norwegian Cold War mystery. What do we know about the Isdal woman? How did she die? And how can this case be solved? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin? This episode involves a mysterious death, and it also briefly mentions some criminal activities that may be relevant to the case. As always, we will be keeping things clinical and non-sensationalistic, but especially sensitive listeners or parents with small or especially sensitive children should keep this in mind. Longtime listeners will also notice some similarities between this mystery and a similar one we covered back in episode 73 on the Somerton Man case from Australia. So people may want to go back and review that episode as well. And where does today's mystery begin? Near Bergen, Norway. Norway, together with Sweden and Denmark, is one of the countries in Scandinavia, which is at the top of northern Europe. Bergen is the second largest city in Norway, after the capital of Oslo. Uh, There are about 300,000 people who live there today, and back in 1970 there were about 200,000. Bergen is in southwestern Norway, on the Atlantic coast, so so it's a North Sea port. Bergen is surrounded by mountains, the highest of which is known as Ulriken Mountain. On the far side of Ulriken, the side opposite from the city, there's a wilderness area known as Istalin. Istalin is Norwegian for Ice Valley, and there's certainly ice there in the wintertime. Since English and Norwegian are both Germanic languages, you can even hear how the terms are related. You can hear how is is the Norwegian equivalent of the word ice. In fact, they even, if in some recordings we'll hear, you'll even hear them pronouncing it more like ice, even though it's just spelled I-S. And then there's the word dal, meaning valley, a low place between raised places. We also have that word in English, but we pronounce it dale, as in over hill and dale, or we pronounce it dell, as in the farmer in the dell. In any event, Isdal is the ice dale or the ice dell, and the Istalin woman in Norwegian is thus the ice valley woman. And so how was she found? On Sunday, November 29th, 1970, a professor and his two daughters, who were aged 10 and 12, were hiking in the Istalin area. The older of the two daughters spotted the body, which had been badly burned. This being the days before cell phones in 1970, they turned around and hiked all the way back to find a phone and notify the police, which meant that they had about an hour's hike before they could even tell anybody. And what did the Bergen police discover once they finally got out to the site? They found the partially burned body of a woman, of course, uh, but right from the start, the situation was weird. In the first place, there wasn't a campsite nearby, so this wasn't a case of someone who went camping and then had an accident with their campfire. Also, the woman was lying down, and the top of the body was much more severely burned than the back of the body was. So this didn't appear to be an ordinary sort of accident, and so the Bergen police contacted a group of specialists in the capital city of Norway, Oslo. The specialists were the Norwegian Criminal Investigation Service, a group known as Kripos. Kripos is the criminal investigation branch of the police. So they came up to Bergen from Oslo on Tuesday, December 1st, two days after the discovery of the body, and investigated the site. As David Morgan writes in his book, Istal Woman, A New Perspective, Around the badly burnt body were many scattered objects, including a burnt rubber boot, a watch, an umbrella, 
melted plastic water bottles, a piece of cake, a small bottle of liqueur, and a tartan shawl. Beneath the body was a fake fur hat which the police later found contained a small trace of petrol. There was no obvious way to identify the woman, no passport, no documents, or set of keys. The labels had been removed from her clothes and the plastic bottles at the scene. There was also no obvious source of an external fire and no obvious signs of struggle other than a small bruise on her neck. So a mysterious death. They found a passport holder, but no passport. And it turned out that just as in the case of the Summerton man, all the labels in her clothes and other means of identification had been removed. Listeners may remember from Summerton Man that back in the day when clothing was very expensive and people didn't have a lot of it, people would write their names on the labels in their clothing. That way you could tell who owned the clothing by looking at the labels. But Summerton Man wanted to hide his identity, so he cut out the labels of his clothing, and Istal Woman did something similar. After doing an initial investigation of the site, the authorities sent the body to be opt autopsied, and they then did a second investigation of the scene to look for more evidence. David Morgan explains, Once the body had been removed to the Gates Institute for the autopsy and the forensic evidence collected and removed, the site was searched by Army engineers with metal detectors and by police with dogs. They tried to locate any evidence distributed further away from the site. No evidence was found of any metal fragments from an explosion, and the dog search only found discarded plastic bags, not linked to the Isdal woman. The Isdal woman did not fit the stereotype of a typical Scandinavian also. While Scandinavians have a range of pigmentations, they are famous for having light skin, a high proportion of people with blonde hair, and a high proportion of people with blue eyes, at least compared to other parts of the world. This is due in part to the fact that they live at very high latitudes, close to the North Pole or closer to the North Pole, so they get less sunlight, especially during winter, and since the sunlight is less strong, it strikes the planet, or it I should say it is less strong because it strikes the planet at a steeper angle up there. And why would that result in them having lighter pigmentation? All humans need vitamin D to survive, and it isn't found in very many foods. So the main way that people have gotten it historically is from exposure to sunlight. Our skin takes the ultraviolet radiation from the sunlight and uses it to make vitamin D. But the main pigment that gives our skin color is melanin. It's a dark pigmentation, and melanin helps block UV light. As a result, people whose ancestors grew up in high latitudes, like the Scandinavians, evolved to have less melanin in their skin so that they could get as much UV light as possible to make the vitamin D they need. But the Istal woman was pigmented differently than the Scandinavian stereotype. Her skin was a bit darker, and she had brownish-black hair and brown eyes. This would have been even less common in Norway in 1970 than it would be today, because there was very little immigration at the time, and most Norwegians' ancestors had been in the country for ages. So, not having any identification for her, they thought Istal woman might be a foreigner. If she wasn't a local, how did they go about trying to identify her? They started checking with the kinds of places that you might find foreigners, like local hotels, youth hostels, and travel facilities in Bergen. Since nobody had reported her missing, they thought Istal woman might have been traveling alone, and that was very unusual for a woman in 1970. Back then, very few women traveled in Norway alone. Also, this made it easy for them to go to hotels and hostels and say, have you recently had any women, possibly foreign women, who stayed with you and were traveling alone? And they immediately got two hits in the nearby city of Stavanger, Norway, which had about 80,000 people in 1970. Stavanger is about 130 miles south of Bergen, and it's also a coastal city. You could travel between the two by taking a hydrofoil boat, which is really cool. <laughs> so uh, who were the two foreign women traveling alone that they heard about? The first was an American tourist named Julie Valentine, but they were told that she had gone to Sweden and was then returning to Seattle, Washington in the United States. So they focused on the other lead. This was a woman named Fenella Lork, who had been staying in the St. Svithin Hotel in Stavanger. According to David Morgan, 
She was described as an oriental or a Mediterranean looking woman with a round face with a gap in her teeth at the top. She spoke German and English badly and possibly had a lisp as she had difficulty saying the letter S. She spent many of the nine days in Stavanger either in her room drinking alcohol or going for long walks returning with muddy boots. The police likely had address details and the passport number for Fenella Lork from the foreign visitor registration card. They contacted the Belgian police to try to track her down, but those details turned out to be fake. The woman had stayed in several hotels with different identities, meaning she would have had to have multiple fake passports. So very mysterious. Fake name, fake home address, and fake passports. And she had been staying in multiple hotels using multiple different fake identities. But they didn't know if the mysterious Fenella Lork was the same person as Istal Woman. I mean, just because you've discovered a mysterious woman using fake names has been staying in local hotels, that doesn't mean that she's the woman whose body you found in the woods. Then how did they go about trying to determine if they were the same person? On Wednesday, December 2nd, they got a break when they discovered that the local railway station had some unclaimed luggage. Someone had checked two suitcases at the railway station on Monday, November 23rd, almost a week before Istal woman, woman was found. But on Friday, November 27th, two days before Istal Woman's body was found, the employees at the train station realized that the suitcases hadn't been claimed. And when the railway employees read about Istal Woman in the papers, they thought the unclaimed suitcases might be hers. So they gave them to the police as part of their investigation. David Morgan explains what they found when they looked inside. The suitcases retrieved from the lost property at the railway station on the 2nd of December, 1970, contained clothes, shoes, a wig, currency from different countries, including Germany, Norway, Belgium, Britain, and Switzerland, cosmetics, a comb and a hairbrush, some teaspoons, and a tube of eczema cream. In addition to these things, there was a pair of sunglasses, and these sunglasses had a fingerprint on them that matched the fingerprints of the Istal woman. So they knew they had Istal woman's luggage, even though they didn't yet know if she was the hotel guest Fenella Lork. They thus did a careful study of all the items in the suitcase, and there were some mysterious things to discover. For a start, the clothing they found also had the labels cut out, presumably to keep her identity hidden. Even if she hadn't written a name in the clothing, the names of the stores where she bought it might be used to trace her. They also found a wig, which was described as being mahogany brown color, and people sometimes use wigs to disguise themselves. And the tube of eczema cream they found was prescription-only stuff, but she'd rubbed off the patient and pharmacy information so she couldn't be identified from that. They also found maps of Scandinavia, which wouldn't be unusual for a traveler, and they found a scalpel-like knife. And, of course, knives have lots of purposes, like cutting out labels and rubbing off identifying information. And they found money, quite a bit of money. Morgan mentioned that it came in from multiple countries, which wouldn't be surprising for an international traveler in Europe. But what was surprising was the amount among what she had were 500 mark notes, so 500 German marks. I checked the records, and that was equivalent to about 1,800 American dollars in 1970, or $13,000 today after the inflation the government has caused. So she was traveling around with more than the equivalent of $13,000 in cash. And they also found she had two notebooks in the luggage. What did these contain? One notebook was blank, but she had inserted a number of things into it. These included a picture of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus, a card with a religious scene, and a postcard with a horse-drawn sleigh. The religious images suggested to some that she might be Catholic, which is what you'd expect if the so-called Fenella Lork was from Belgium, as Belgium is a majority Catholic country, even more so in 1970 than today. While the first notebook was blank, the other notebook had writing in it, and the writing was very interesting. One page had several columns of letters and numbers in what appeared to be a code, so they sent to have it decrypted. 
Finally, the suitcases also contained a bag for a shoe store in the city of Stavanger, and this provided the link they needed to hotel guest Fenella Lork. When they went to the shoe store, the staff told them they did have a customer matching Fenella's description, and she bought a pair of size 38 celebrity sailor boots matching the one found with Istal Woman's body. So they concluded that Istal Woman was the hotel guest Fenella Lork, and they were one and the same person. And when did they get the pathology report back on her body? On Monday, December 7th, just over a week after finding her body. One of the things they always look for when they have an unknown person is their dental work, and they found Istal Woman had a lot of it done. Morgan explains... The number of fillings and teeth indicated poor dental hygiene initially, with extensive repair work with expensive gold fillings and bridges later in her life. The source of these bridges was determined by Interpol to be from Spain or Italy. Although they weren't sure of that. They just thought that some of the dental work looked like it used the kinds of bridges that Spanish and Italian dentists used. But others have said that the dentistry looks like it could be German or from farther east, like Poland. As far as Istal Woman herself, the autopsy report described her this way. She had brown eyes, was 164 centimeters tall, or 5 feet 4 inches, round face, slender, more than 12 to 14 refilled teeth with expensive gold bridges. In her hair, she had a blue and white hairband with stars and flowers. She was wearing a blue cardigan, black outerwear, green and blue woolen tartan shawl, celebrity sailor's style rubber boots with a white sole and edging at the top with laces on the front. On her arm, she had a sports watch made of steel marked Solo. On her ears, she had round filigree clip-on earrings. On her head, she wore a dark leather hat with imitation fur. She was in possession of a blue nylon woman's umbrella. The most significant findings in the autopsy related to the cause of death. It turns out there was more than one thing involved. The fire alone was not responsible, though she was alive when the fire was burning. There was soot in her lungs, which meant that she was still breathing during the fire. Part of her death was thus listed as due to carbon monoxide poisoning due to the smoke inhalation. But carbon monoxide wasn't the only thing poisoning her. Her blood also contained high levels of barbiturates. Barbiturates are a class of drug that serves to depress or slow down the central nervous system. The barbiturate she had in her was phenobarbital, which was a very common drug at the time. Today, Phenobarbital is used to treat epileptic seizures, but it's also been used for a whole bunch of other things. And in 1970, it was commonly used as a tranquilizer to help with insomnia and anxiety. So back then, it was a common sleeping pill and anti-anxiety medication. The autopsy showed that Istal woman had taken between 50 and 70 tablets of phenobarbital. Now, the recommended dose for this drug is between 30 and 320 milligrams a day, or about 175 milligrams if you just split that amount down the middle. The pills that Istal woman was taking were 60 milligram tablets, and she took around 60 of them, meaning she took around a 3,600 milligram dose all at once, or about 21 times the recommended daily dose. So her death was ruled to be due to a combination of carbon monoxide poisoning from the fire and phenobarbital poisoning from the pills. Those factors obviously will play a role when we look at the ultimate reasons behind her death, but there are more things to look at regarding her life. What did the authorities determine after they submitted the codes in her notebook for analysis? They discovered that it was an extremely simple code. In fact, you could consider it more of a personal system of abbreviation or shorthand rather than a code per se. In other words, it may not have been an attempt to actually disguise information. It may have just been a way for her to take quick personal notes for herself.
The information was laid out in a series of columns. The in the column was composed of letters and numbers. There were some variations, but the overall pattern was pretty clear. The letters and numbers were arranged in such a way that made it obvious that the first bunch of the letters and numbers represented a set of dates, followed by what was usually a single letter at the end. For example, one of the entries was J8J21R. Another was N9N18S. By noticing which letters were paired with numbers, and that the numbers were all between 1 and 31, they quickly realized that they were abbreviations for months and days. So J8J21 meant June 8th to June 21st, and N9N18 meant November 9th to November 18th. And what about the final letters in the entry, R and S? S turned out to be Stavanger, the city she had stayed in for nine days between November 9th and November 18th. R isn't 100% certain, but it appears to be Rome, and she spent a lot of time there. In any event, the coded entries turned out to be abbreviated shorthand for her travel itinerary. S turned out to be Stavanger, the city she had stayed in for nine days between November 9th and November 18th. R isn't 100% certain, but it appears to be Rome, and she spent a lot of time at R. In any event, the coded entries turned out to be an abbreviated shorthand for her travel itinerary, and this helped them piece together a good bit of where she had been and when. I've seen it reported that the entries didn't match her actual movements 100%, so it may be that the list represents her planned itinerary, which changed, or it may have been something she composed after the fact and she misremembered a few things, or there could be some other explanation. And at the bottom of the page was a mysterious entry that didn't fit the pattern. What did it say? This entry had more letters and only one number in it. It read... ML 23 N M M. The 23 N looks like the 23rd of November, which is apparently the day she checked out of her hotel in Bergen and was likely the day that she died. However, the letter combinations of ML and MM don't have an obvious meaning. They also don't appear anywhere else on the page, so no one is sure what to make of them. They could represent places she was going to go, or people she was going to meet, or something else entirely. As they were able to reconstruct her travel itinerary, they were able to locate the hotels in which she stayed. What did they learn when they spoke with staff people in the hotels? She used at least eight different aliases accompanied by fake passport numbers and home addresses. But one consistency was that she always said she was from Belgium. And that would suggest that she either was from Belgium or that she'd spent a good bit of time there or was from a place just over the border from Belgium. That way, she'd be able to answer questions about Belgium if anyone ever started quizzing her about her background. It would make it harder for them to catch her in lies if she actually knew the place that she said she was from. She also gave a range of birthdays, and there was an interesting pattern in the years she mentioned. She repeatedly listed her year of birth as 1943 and 1945, but she never used 1944, the year between them. That could suggest that 1944 was her real birth year, and she deliberately avoided it so as not to give an extra clue to finding her identity. What about her name? People who go by fake names often pick ones similar to their real name so that they'll respond more quickly when people refer to them and they have less chance of forgetting what they're calling themselves. Were there any patterns in the names she gave? Not really. For her first name, she called herself Fenella, Elizabeth, Genevieve, Claudia, Vera, and Alexis. So there's no real pattern there. And for her last name, she used Lork, Leonhauer, Lancier, Tielt, Schlossenek, Nielsen, and Zarnem Merchez. So 
no clear pattern with either name that could let us guess her original name. Although the fact that her last names tended to either begin with an L or have an L in their first syllable could mean that she had a last name with a prominent L. That might make her respond quicker or help her respond quicker if the hotel staff referred to her as Miss Lork, Miss Leonhauer, Miss Lancier, and so forth. When you come into a country, you need to say what the purpose of your visit is. What reasons did she give for her stays? She gave a number of them. In one case, she said that the purpose of her visit was tourism. However, in most cases, she said that she was there on business. Once, she used a phrase in German that indicated she was there trading with goods. In another case, she said she was handling antiques, which would make her an antiques dealer. And in another case, she used a word or phrase that apparently doesn't exist in German, but I've heard it pseudo-translated as saying she was trading with professions. And this suggested she had only an imperfect knowledge of German, just like she was reported to have. She was said to speak English and German badly. And was there any evidence that she was doing any of these things? No, uh, she didn't appear to have any stock with her, you know, antiques or other items that she was trying to sell. Neither did she seem to be buying items for stock to take back with her. Though, hypothetically, she could have been making purchases and planning on having them shipped. Though, that's unlikely since she was giving out fake addresses to the hotels. If you ship something to a fake address, it wouldn't get there. So, if she was there on legitimate business for legitimate business dealings, you wouldn't expect her to be using fake addresses. What were the hotel staff able to determine from what they saw of her and what she did in the hotels? They occasionally saw her meeting with men, and she also acted rather strangely. David Morgan explains, In two hotels, there was a description of a man in her hotel room. Often the men didn't speak with witnesses present, so there was no indication as to their purpose. They found details of her having breakfast with one man in another hotel's restaurant, looking at a large piece of paper. They discovered the Isdal woman also exhibited strange behaviors, like requesting to change rooms frequently and moving furniture. Other evidence suggested she was being very frugal, only eating porridge for breakfast and not deviating from a low-cost breakfast. She stayed in her room and drank al alcohol or returned from walks with muddy boots. At one time, she removed a letter D from the bathroom door, in Norwegian bath or bathroom is bad, so it has a D in it, and she placed it on her hotel room door. She keeps requesting to change rooms and putting a chair outside the room, perhaps to make more space, to open two suitcases and remove the labels from the clothing and cosmetics. So she spent a good bit of time uh, drinking or taking walks, but she also occasionally met with individual men who tended not to speak when the hotel staff was present. She was very frugal, even though she was carrying more than $13,000 in cash. She frequently requested room changes. She frequently moved furniture around, including putting a chair in the hallway when she was in the room, though she would put it back inside whenever she left the room. She once removed the letter D from a bathroom door and put it on her own door. Very unusual behavior. And it's been pointed out that putting the D on her door and moving the chair inside and outside could be a signal to someone. And she also reportedly blocked her door by taking a table that was normally set by the window, turning it upside down and putting it on the floor in the entryway leading to her door. Now, some of the Norwegians who met her also stated that she gave off an unusual odor. She smelled different from other people. And in later years, one of the witnesses identified the smell. We often don't realize it, but our body odor is affected by the diet we regularly eat. I remember as a kid meeting people from other cultures and noting that they smelled like the spices used in their country's cuisine. And there's been at least one study indicating that people who eat vegetarian diets and people who eat omnivorous diets can smell different. Well, back in 1970, Norwegian cooking was very traditional, but in later decades, more types of foreign cuisines were introduced in Norway, and these new cuisines included garlic.
And that's what the witnesses realized Istal woman smelled like. She smelled like garlic. So as an international traveler, she may have been spending a lot of time in a place where garlic was a prominent ingredient in the cuisine, like Rome, Italy, where her travel itinerary seemed to indicate she spent a lot of time. Witnesses also reported noting an unusual heavy perfume smell, which she might have been using to try to cover up the garlic odor. Or maybe she just liked pungent perfume. When was the last time Istal woman is known to have been seen alive? On Monday, November 23rd, 1970, six days before her body was found, she checked out of her room in Bergen, where she'd been staying for four days. After she left, she departed by taxi, and apparently that day she also visited a bank, and this was the day her luggage was checked in at the train station. But there are no confirmed sightings of her after she left the hotel. However, some witnesses did report seeing smoke rising from the Istalin Valley, and one of the pathologists estimated she had been dead for six days based on the state of her body. So Monday, November 23rd, was the last day she was seen alive at her hotel, and it was likely the day she died. Since she was an international traveler, did the local police check with foreign law enforcement agencies? They did. They contacted the police in countries where they knew she'd been. Uh, they also contacted Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, but nobody could identify her. And what did the police tell the public? On December 21st, three weeks after her death, the Bergen police held a press conference in which Criminal Investigation Chief Hordness spoke. Crime Chief Hordness, there have been a number of fanciful theories in the press surrounding this case. Was this woman involved with espionage? No, I think we can safely say there is nothing to support this. Actually, we can completely rule that out. Is this a murder? No. Well, the case hasn't been closed yet, but from the very beginning, we have been presuming that there didn't exist... From the very beginning at the crime scene, we're still waiting for the final toxicology results. But based on what we know, there's nothing giving us any reason to assume anything different. Crime scene, toxicology, and autopsy reports do not seem to change that impression. Which country is she from? Well, that's hard to say, but we're working towards a theory that she's possibly from France, more specifically from Paris. So, Jimmy, if Istal woman consistently listed her nationality as Belgian... Why were the police thinking she might have been from Paris? Because the wig they found in her suitcase had been bought in Paris, and because they had a report of her speaking French fluently. But those aren't decisive, because any international traveler can buy a wig in Paris, and French is one of the major languages of Belgium, with 40% of the population belonging to the French-speaking community. So what finally happened with the case? Having been unable to identify her, they finally buried her on Friday, February 5th, 1971, just over two months after she'd been discovered. They placed the body in a zinc-lined casket to preserve it in hopes that eventually she'd be identified and could be reburied where her family directed. As we mentioned in previous episodes, element 30, or zinc, has antimicrobial properties, so it would help preserve the body until the family could claim it. In light of the indications they had that she might be Catholic, they arranged for a Catholic priest to perform the small service, but since nobody knew her, it was almost exclusively police officers in attendance. And even after the burial, the investigation continued until June of 1971, though they never solved the case. Crime Commissioner Hordnes said that they could completely rule out the idea that Istal woman was involved in espionage. Is there reason to think that there's more to the story than what the police said? Absolutely. Because even though they denied having a file on her for many years, the Norwegian counterintelligence secret police eventually admitted they also had been investigating her. So this wasn't just of interest to the Bergen police or the Kripos criminal police, but to the secret police as well. All right. And so before we get to our theories and our faith and reason perspectives, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Jack W., Lenny B., Sam F., Rachel F., and David K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com give 
make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the Isdal woman? There are two basic kinds of theories that we need to consider here. The first involves who she was, and the second involves how she died. When it comes to who she was, there are a number of possibilities. She could have been just an innocent traveler, or she could have been a criminal of some kind, including being a spy. When it comes to her death, it could have been an accident, it could have been suicide, or it could have been murder. These uh, basic theories can then be combined in different ways. For example, she could have been an innocent traveler who died as a result of an accident, or an innocent traveler who got murdered, or a criminal who committed suicide, or a spy who got murdered, and so forth. Okay, so what can we say about Istal woman from the reason perspective? Let's start with the manner of her death. We know she died as a result of the sleeping pills and the fire, but what did the pathologist ultimately decide led to that? The pathologist ultimately did not make a determination. They did not decide whether it was an accident, a suicide, or a homicide. They left that issue open. Could it have been an accident? No, though some have proposed this theory. Uh, for example, it's been suggested that she was out in the woods and decided to light a fire, perhaps to get warm, and then something happened, like maybe she dropped a can of hairspray into the fire and it exploded. That could explain why the top surface of her body was burned much more than the back surface, because she was facing the can of hairspray and the fire when the explosion happened, and then she fell over backwards, perhaps hitting her head on a rock and knocking her herself out, allowing the fire to do its work. And what's wrong with that theory? In the first place, it doesn't look like she or anyone else was trying to build a campfire. It looked like she was deliberately burned, not that anyone was trying to build a small fire separate from her body. Also, there was no can of hairspray found at the site or the remains of a can, even though they searched extensively for it. More fundamentally, there's the 50 to 70 sleeping pills she took. You don't accidentally take 60 sleeping pills while you're out on a hike. That's something that happened deliberately. Either she herself deliberately took that many pills or someone forced her to consume them. But whether the fire involved some kind of accident or not, the sleeping pills were deliberate. Therefore, this was no case of a simple accident. It had to be either suicide or homicide. If we can eliminate one of the death theories that quickly, can we eliminate any of the identi identity theories as readily as that? Yeah, uh, because there is no way this woman was an innocent traveler. Innocent travelers do not maintain eight or more false identities, including false passports. Ordinary people would not even know how to get false identity documents like that. And false passports on the black market are expensive, so she would have had to have used significant financial resources to get them. And ordinary innocent travelers wouldn't know how to get them, and they would never spend the money to get eight of them, even if they knew how. So she was no innocent traveler. The only scenario that makes sense is that she was engaged in some kind of criminal activity that required her to keep her true identity secret and to switch frequently between multiple false identities. Now, you'll note, I said, that's the only, area, that's the only scenario that makes sense. Of course, you could propose that she wasn't making sense. She wasn't in her right mind. Instead, you could propose she was a crazy person who was super paranoid and spent all her money and used the false identities for no reason. Now, you'll note that I said that that's the only scenario that makes sense. Of course, you could propose that she wasn't making sense, that she wasn't in her right mind. Instead, you could say she was a crazy person who was super paranoid and spent all the money and used the false identities for no reason. However, when you see something 
or someone acting like an international criminal, the most likely explanation is that they are an international criminal, not an innocent, crazy person who happens to be acting like an international criminal. So I proceed on the most likely interpretation of the facts so far. Istal woman was engaged in some kind of international criminal activity, and she either committed suicide or was murdered. If she was a criminal, what kind of crimes would she have been committing? There are a number of possibilities, but two of them seem more probable than the others. Now, there are many individual kinds of international crimes, including drug smuggling, antiquities, art or jewel smuggling, arms dealing, money laundering, human trafficking. Human trafficking. So Istal woman could have been part of an international crime ring, but there isn't evidence of any of these particular crimes in her case. Instead, the two that could have evidence supporting them would be prostitution and espionage. What evidence would be consistent with the idea she was a prostitute? By all reports, she was very physically attractive. She also dressed stylishly in a way that called attention to herself. And she was seen with individual men, sometimes in her hotel room, though they were only seen sitting quietly in the room with her, fully dressed and not in the bed or in a state of undress. And also, prostitutes may assume aliases to make it harder for the police to catch them. What would be the argument against her being a prostitute? If she was a prostitute, she was a very unusual one. Most prostitutes are poor and operate locally out of a single place, such as the red light district in a single city. By contrast, Istal woman apparently had quite a bit of money and was an international traveler going all over Europe. I guess it's possible that she was some kind of high-priced courtesan who catered to wealthy clients, and you might expect to find such a person in major Euro European cities she visited, like Paris and Rome, but not so much in 1970s Norway. Also, she smelled funny to people in 1970s Norway. There were the reports that she smelled like garlic, and others reported her using an unusual perfume, which might have been to cover up the garlic smell. But you'd expect a high price courtesan to be more attuned to her clients than that. There's also another factor weighing against the prostitute theory, which is the hotels that she stayed in. What can you tell us about that? It may come as a surprise to people who live in America, where all our hotels are secular, but in Europe there are explicitly Christian hotels. The purpose of these hotels is to promote Christian values within their walls, and as a result they can have very strict rules. If they're Protestant, they may prohibit the drinking of alcohol, and they certainly have strict rules regarding visits by members of the opposite sex, like men visiting the rooms of women, especially during the evening hours. And what does the record show about Istal woman? Although she was an international traveler, she often stayed in this type of Christian hotel. In some hotels, she may have spent time alone, drinking in her room, but she was not living the kind of high life where a prostitute could cavort with her clients. If she wanted to do that, or if she wanted to engage in any of the standard kind of criminal activity, she would not have checked into hotels with stricter Christian codes of conduct for the guests. That's a sign that she either wasn't a prostitute or any other kind of standard criminal. What about the idea Istal woman was a spy? Before we get into that subject, we should point out that being a prostitute and being a spy are not mutually incompatible. Intelligence services frequently use prostitutes to gain information or compromise targets. This is a practice known as honey trapping, and the person who does the seduction is known as a honeypot. So it is possible that Istal Woman was in the service of an intelligence agency and was serving as a honeypot. So why would anyone want to send spies to Norway in 1970? because it was the Cold War, and because Norway is part of NATO, and because Norway shares a border with the Soviet Union. As a result, Norway was a strategic location in this period, and we know that there were a lot of spies in the country during the Cold War. In 2018, the BBC and the Norwegian national broadcaster NRK began producing a podcast series on Istal Woman called Death in Ice Valley. In it, they pointed out that the city of Bergen itself was a place of Cold War interest. 
the biggest naval base in Norway had moved to Bergen in the early 60s. So what we saw in the streets of Bergen too were a lot of marine soldiers going out on leave for the evening. And in the sea outside Bergen, there was regularly big NATO exercises when warships from the USA, from Germany, from England were in the harbour, very often in the weekends when they had a rest in the rehearsals. And there were submarines coming here. And during all the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of sightings of submarines in the fjords in the western part of Norway, which most likely were Russian submarines, or to see if there was some marine installations used. Because, of course, in the, in the 1960s and 70s, the Cold War was more or less on its strongest. It was a, quite a big fear of a war against the Soviet Union. So the Soviets were nosing around the Norwegian fjords with their submarines looking for NATO activities. And they'd also want to get agents on the ground to investigate inside Norway. And where Eastern Bloc spies go, Western Bloc spies go, because America and its NATO allies would want to keep tabs on what the Soviet spies were doing as part of their own counterintelligence efforts. So if Istal Woman was a spy, she could have been working for NATO, for the Warsaw Pact, or for someone else like Israel. What would the argument be that she was not a spy? Well, first, spies generally try not to call attention to themselves. They try to blend in. But Istal Woman stood out prominently in 1970s Norway as an attractive foreign woman traveling alone. Second, it's, been also, it's also been said that if she were a Soviet agent, she would have had only one or two alternative identities, although she may not have been working for the Soviets, but for an agency that had different identity masking practices. Or she just may may have been an unusual case. Third, most spies don't bounce rapidly from place to place over the course of a year the way that Istal Woman had been doing in 1970. Instead, they embed in a single location and try to become experts on it, or they undertake a few targeted missions. But there is one class of spy that might undertake the kind of mission that could fit Istal Woman's travel itinerary. That would be a courier, someone sent to make contact with locally embedded assets to give them instructions and to bring back information. And a courier might use more than one or two identities to try to mask their extensive international travels. And if she was acting as a honeypot, she could have been calling attention to herself to recruit and seduce new assets or otherwise keep herself attractive to manipulate existing assets. Is it possible that if she were a spy, she may not have been following best spy practices? And that's what resulted in her calling attention to herself? It's quite possible. Just because someone's a spy doesn't mean that they're good at their job. In fact, Istal Woman may not have been serving as a honeypot at all. If she was born in 1944, she would have been 26 years old, which is quite young for a spy. So she may have been an inexperienced agent working as a courier who called too much attention to herself. In fact, that might be why she ended up dead. There's a long history of spies being bunglers who completely botched their assignments, which is something we'll talk about in future episodes. In the meantime, for the sake of a concrete illustration, can you give an example of a spy who could be a notorious bungler? I'd point to former CIA agent E. Howard Hunt. We talked about him back in Episode 7 on the Watergate break-in. He was a notorious bungler, and Watergate was only one of the operations he botched. He is known, for example, to have used really bad disguises that actually called attention to himself. For example, at one point, Hunt went to the hospital room of a Mrs. Dita Beard to speak with her, but he was wearing a cheap red wig that actually called called attention to him. In their book, All the President's Men, Woodward and Bernstein write, Woodward had reached Mrs. Beard's 24-year-old son, Robert, in Denver. Woodward asked if he recalled a visit to his mother by Howard Hunt. Beard said that a mysterious man wearing a cheap wig and makeup had visited his mother in the hospital just before she issued her statement. From pictures I've seen, it could have been Howard Hunt, but I couldn't tell, Robert said. The man refused to identify himself. He seemed to have inside information about what would happen next. He was very eerie. He did have a red wig on, cockeyed, as if he'd put it on in a dark car. 
I couldn't have identified my brother like that. On another occasion, Hunt and Watergate co-conspirator G. Gordon Liddy were sent to Los Angeles to burgle the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. The CIA gave them disguises, including thick glasses, wigs, a device to alter Liddy's walk, and a device to alter Hunt's speech. Here's how G. Gordon Liddy later described the result. In order to alter my appearance, I was provided with a pair of uh, German manufactured glasses. You'll see that they ha appear to have Coke bottle bottom lenses and would give uh, any viewer of someone wearing these the idea that I was just this side of total blindness. So there we were, walking about uh, in uh, Los Angeles, in the heat, sweating under these very well-fitting wigs, I stumbling along like a cripple, Howard Hunt babbling along like this, all courtesy of the Central Intelligence Agency. So, yeah, there's a lot of incompetent spycraft. And as a result, I don't find the she called too much attention to herself to be a spy argument at all persuasive. That rebuts an argument against her being a spy. But do we have any positive evidence that Istal woman may have been involved in espionage work? We do. You'll recall that we mentioned that even though they denied it for years, the Norwegian counterintelligence secret police eventually admitted that they had been investigating the death of Istal woman. So this wasn't just of interest to the Bergen police or even the uh, Kripos criminal investigation police, but to the secret police as well. Also, on Monday, December 21st, Crime Chief Hordness had assured the public that they could completely rule out the idea that Istal woman was involved in espionage, but the secret police had a document dated the very next day the 22nd, that told a different story. And the journalists from Death in Ice Valley got to see it. Well, we are here at the secret police in Norway holding the file, the secret file of the Eisdal woman. We see here they're marked with secret. Yes, that's, that's the classification from, from 1970 uh, and secret. In the Norwegian system, it's the, the second highest classification. Um, this is a document. It's dated December 22nd, 1970, and it tells about a fisherman, a local fisherman in Tonanger, who uh, claims that he has seen the woman close to his home and at the same time as the Norwegian defense tested a new missile system, the so-called Penguin missile system. And she's supposed to have been watching these uh, missile tests uh, at several different times. And she is supposed to have been in Bergen and Stavanger at the same time as the missile tests were conducted. And that is, of course, uh, very suspicious. So a fisherman from the remote seaside village of Tenanger reported seeing Istal woman watching the tests of a new state-of-the-art missile system known as Penguin. Penguin was a lightweight missile system used to target ships, and she reportedly watched several tests, including when she was staying in Stavanger and Bergen, where the naval base was. The fisherman's name was Berthon Rot, and the folks from Death in Ice Valley tracked down his son, and he took them out for a walk on one of the keys in the village. Yeah, this was in 1970, and my father has just got his uh, new trawler, and he was um, uh, working on his trawl to fix it, to repair it, and uh, approaching him when he was alone at the quayside, there walked a lady. Afterwards, he remembered about this lady. She looked Slavic, could be Russian, could be Romanian. But uh, that was first, he was thinking, after he saw her speaking on the other kai with um, one um, of the officers at the MTB, Navy vessels, because at this time they were trying out the Penguin rockets for the Norwegian defense system. So this woman, first she came down here where we are walking now? Yes. She came and she looked around when she was out there and he was repairing the trawl. She was nicely dressed and uh, nice hair, he said, and uh, didn't say a word. But uh, he became suspicious when he observed her afterwards speaking with one of the officers. Why she should? 
he always says, because she was speaking some time with him. It wasn't like two, one minute, it was longer time. And why she should speak with him so long time? His theory was that she had uh, this man she was talking with could be an accomplice. And uh, that was what he believed. So fisherman Berthon Rott was suspicious of this attractive, well-dressed, foreign-looking woman coming into the remote fishing village of Tenanger, coming down to the Keys and speaking for an unusually long time with a Norwegian naval officer. And he ultimately concluded that the officer may have been an accomplice, and he reported the incident to the police. Did the secret police take him seriously? They did. They not only opened a classified file and investigated, they also came back to Mr. Rott with a rather significant warning. They showed up when he was at the Stavanger Railway Station, where he and his family were leaving to go to London for the Christmas holiday. We were all four. The family was gathered there and should go on the train. And um, he uh, left our group and uh, went with these policemen for about 15, 20 minutes, obviously talking with them. And uh, he didn't say much to us. He said it was some policemen. And then we were wondering about this the whole trip we were in London. Did, did he say why they came to the train station? What, what did they want to speak with him about? My father was a man of few words when things should be kept secret, you know. So when we came back, I was informed that he had had this knife and this handgun that he received from them, that they gave him that uh, in the railway station, and he had that all the time we were in London. Really? For protection, yes. Yeah, did he say something? Why? Why did they give him this? Obviously, he was told by some people to keep his mouth shut. Obviously. Because uh, he... Um, normally didn't like to speak so much about it. But on the other hand, he was angry sometime. He was rather upset about that, uh, why he was not properly informed. Mm -hmm. So himself, he lacked knowledge about the whole situation. And how long was your father told he, he would need this gun and this knife? Did he keep it permanently? He had it for many years, but... Uh, in many ways, it was a story we didn't speak so much about. Sometimes I feel he looked behind his shoulder sometimes. That was just a feeling, you know. How did this whole thing affect your father, you, you think? You said he, he looked over his shoulder. W was he anxious about something? Yes, he was. He was very much stressed about this case. All the years he... he um, he would have wanted that the truth came forward, you know. He would have wanted that. It was like a cover-up. It was like a layer of protection around this whole question about this lady. So the secret police come up to him in the train station, take him away for 15 or 20 minutes, tell him to keep his mouth shut, and give him a gun and a knife and tell him to protect himself. But they don't give him a detailed briefing on who he's supposed to protect himself from, which understandably caused him anxiety. So he takes his family to London and back under this cloud, and as we heard back in episode 181 on D.B. Cooper, nobody was checking your baggage in 1970, so he certainly could have gotten there and back with the gun and the knife. He then kept the gun and the knife for years, occasionally looking over his shoulder and resenting the fact that the truth never came out about Istal woman, feeling that the authorities were covering up what they knew. And it wasn't just this one fisherman's perception of Istal woman behaving suspiciously. She also acted suspiciously in the hotels, like with the repeated request to change rooms and possibly arranging signals as to whether she was in or out. And the investigation into her movements in Norway showed that she also was in Stavanger and Bergen when the missile system was being tested. Let's talk about the men she was meeting with while she was in Norway. Could they also have been espionage contacts? 
They could have, and the way they behaved in front of witnesses could be suggestive of that. Like Istal Woman, they acted very strangely and not particularly friendly. There appear to have been at least three such men that she was seen with. One of them was an older gentleman who looked like he may have been Norwegian. Death in Ice Valley spoke to a waitress who served them at dinner in the hotel. She was with a man. She had a serious face. Yeah. Yes. And uh, don't say much. She was speaking German? Yes. Yes. To, to the staff? Yes. Was it a different language with the man? Did you hear anything no, from the conversation? Don't, don't conversation. This is only eat ah. and uh, he sit with one paper and uh, she uh, don't say anything. They were silent. Yes. Uh, a sheet of paper? Yes, not newspaper. Was he writing or reading? No, she or? is reading the paper. But they were sitting together because yes. they knew each other? Yes. But that you didn't see them talk to each no. other? No. So it wasn't a romantic no. dinner or something? No. Not romantic. Was it more like a, a meeting between the two yes. of them? Yes. So they had a dinner in which she looked very serious, and they didn't speak a word. Instead, they strangely passed a piece of paper between them. It was distinctly non-romantic and looked like some kind of unusual serious meeting. This is not the kind of behavior that you would expect if the man were a business partner, a friend, a relative, or a romantic partner. And it's certainly not the kind of behavior you would expect if Istal woman was a prostitute trying to please a client. However, it is what you might expect if the man were engaged in espionage or other criminal activities, particularly if they were concerned that something might be going wrong. And who was the second man she was seen with? He was a dark-haired man that she visited a shop with. Death in Ice Valley spoke to the shop woman who served them. She was coming together with this man uh, into the shop where I worked and were going to buy a mirror. So they were discussing quite a lot before they finally found a mirror that was not too small and, and not expensive, just uh, one of the cheapest that we had, yes. A mirror? A mirror, yes. Was it kind of a mirror which you were holding in the hand? No, no. no. It was a mirror to hang on the wall. It was about this size, a meter, meter and a half. Yeah. At that time, I didn't think about it, but um, they were both foreigners. They looked Eastern Europe, something like that, and he was dark. It was not like they were very friendly to each other. It didn't sound like it was friendly. Like I said, they were sort of arguing when they were buying this. They weren't smiling or anything like that. They were sort of, oh. So a dark-haired Eastern European looking man who spoke with her in a language the shop woman didn't recognize and who seemed to be having a low-key argument with Istal woman. Again, not the behavior you would expect from Istal woman if the man were a business partner, a friend, a relative, a romantic partner, or a client. And they bought a cheap three to five foot long wall mirror. If Istal woman was staying in a hotel, why would they buy a wall mirror? Unclear. No such mirror was left behind in her hotel or found with her belongings. Uh, it could have been for the man to take, or she could have planned to have it shipped elsewhere to wherever she lived. Or the purchase of a cheap mirror could have simply been to justify why they were having a tense conversation in a shop. And people involved in espionage situations may wish to meet in public rather than in private, especially if they don't trust each other. That could explain both the mirror purchase and the weird wordless dinner she had. What about the third man she was seen meeting? She uh, met him in private in one of the hotel rooms when the maid came in to turn down the bed for the evening she saw him. And when she opened the door, the maid found Istal woman sitting on her bed in a black dress with a young blonde man in a gray collared suit sitting across the room. Here's what the maid reported seeing. She describes the woman with dark hair, beautiful face, dark eyes pretty skin in the face, black dress, and seemed like she was in sorrow in some way. She was thinking she must have grief because she looked so sad. And 
This roommate, she just describes the man as around 25 to 30 years old. Tall, well-built, yes, broad shoulders, blonde hair, nice face. And he was dressed in a gray colored suit. The maid apologized for the intrusion and asked if she could turn down the bed. Istal woman stood up and let her do so, after which the maid left the room. And the weird thing is, neither Istal woman nor the man she was meeting with said a single word the whole time the maid was in the room. No hellos, goodbyes, thank yous, absolutely nothing, just complete silence from beginning to end. And Istal woman looked visibly sad to the maid, and neither she nor the man said anything, which was quite strange and also suggests something secretive going on. We have a lot of forensic techniques now that didn't exist back in 1970. Have researchers tried using any of those to clarify who Istal woman may have been? They have, but the results are inconclusive, and I don't think too much weight should be put on them. They've tested the isotopes in her teeth, and those can suggest where you were at the time the teeth were forming, where, where you were living, because the isotopes that get into your teeth will depend on the local food and water that you're consuming. They checked places in Europe, and apparently only Europe, where those isotope combinations can be found, and they point out a number of different possible locations, but none of them are very definite. There is a suggestion that her early childhood may have been spent somewhere in southern Germany, perhaps near Nuremberg, but then she may have moved because the teeth that come in later have a different isotope pattern. On the website for Death in Ice Valley, they've got a map of the location she may have moved to, and you will have a link so that you can take a look at it yourself. You'll see that there are possible locations in many parts of Europe, so this is quite inconclusive in my mind. And they don't show us the early childhood map, so I can't really tell how strong the isotopic signal near Nuremberg was. Uh, It could have been weaker than they made it sound. What other kinds of forensic tests have they done? They also did tests on her teeth to try to find out how old she was at death and when she was born. The results they got uh, suggested that she was around 45 years old in 1970, which means that she would have been born around 1925 instead of 1944. In other words, she would have been 20 years older than what she said, and more importantly, 20 years older than people said she looked. Are there reasons to doubt the result of the test? There are. It's been criticized from a scientific perspective. In in the first place, the test is not foolproof. And it turns out that the teeth had been boiled in an alkali solution that would interfere with their chemistry and throw off the dating. So I can't have confidence in that dating. And I think the evidence supports the view that she was born in the in the early 1940s, likely in 1944. I also think that Death in Ice Valley really goes off the rails here because they just accept the idea that she was born in the 1920s, and that leads them to spend a lot of time speculating about whether she might have been a German-Jewish girl whose parents sent her away to escape the Nazis in the 1930s. I mean, that's an exciting scenario, and it's hypothetically possible but it depends on accepting a single problematic test on her teeth that contradicts what multiple eyewitnesses said about her age. What about DNA testing? Have they done that? They have, as they were able to retrieve DNA from a tissue sample they had on file. They discovered that there are no matches for her nuclear DNA in the Interpol database, which is actually pretty small, so that didn't lead anywhere. They also checked her mitochondrial DNA, which we inherit only from our mothers, and they found out, big surprise, that her mother was of European ancestry, so that doesn't really narrow it down much. Why don't they check her DNA against public databases like the kind people use to find lost relatives? Those have millions of people in them, and we might be able to determine her family of origin and then figure out who she was, like the way the Golden State Killer was caught, as we discussed back in episode 38. This is the most likely way of finding out her identity, and I think it is very likely it will eventually be determined in exactly this way. But the Norwegian police haven't used the process yet. Why not? 
Apparently, because of ethical legal privacy concerns, the use of public DNA databases to catch criminals is controversial, and thus far they haven't tried it with Istal Woman. But a geneticist with the American DNA Doe Project offered to help in trying to push this line of investigation further, and we may eventually get results. Have there been any other interesting leads in the case? There is one that I find interesting. Wikipedia summarizes it like this. In 2019, after a publication on the case in Le Republicain Lorraine, an inhabitant of Forbach, France, claims to have had a relationship with the woman in the summer of 1970. The woman, a polyglot, supposedly had a Balkan accent. She pretended to be about 26 years old, but often dressed herself up to look younger and refused to share any personal details. She is said to have often received scheduled phone calls from abroad. The resident managed to rifle through her belongings and found various wigs and colorful clothes. He had also pilfered a photograph of the woman riding a horse. Suspecting she was a spy, he considered contacting the authorities, but was afraid to do so. His story and the photograph were published in a subsequent issue of the newspaper. There is very little proof of this account, and it easily could be wrong or even a deliberate hoax. However, the picture of the woman on the horse is available, and we'll have a link to it so you can see it for yourself. Even if we eventually learn Isdal Woman's true identity, that wouldn't reveal what happened to her. She still could have died either as a result of suicide or murder. So what can we say here? It's hypothetically possible that this was a case of suicide. If Isdal Woman were a spy or a criminal, she could have gotten tired of that, felt trapped, and saw no other way out except suicide, especially if something was going wrong and she was having tense meetings with associates, some or all of whom she may not have trusted. However, sleeping pills and setting yourself on fire is an extremely improbable way to commit suicide. Phenobarbital overdose was a way that some people committed suicide back in the 1970s, but people who wanted to kill themselves by going to sleep didn't also set themselves on fire. An Istal woman would have had to do that if this was a suicide because she had smoke in her lungs from the fire, so she was still alive when it was burning. And self-immolation is an extremely unpopular way to commit suicide because nobody wants to be burned alive. Indeed, if people try that, they're likely to fail because as soon as you catch on fire, you're going to immediately regret it and start trying to put the fire out, such as by rolling around on the ground to quench it. Though, if you've drugged yourself first, you might not be able to do that. Aside from the problem of setting herself on fire, are there other considerations that could point away from suicide? One is that they found a bruise on her neck, which could have been from an attack by her killer. But it also could have been an injury from a fall or something she'd gotten days before her death, so it's not much evidence. More significant is the fact that the day she died, she visited a bank in Bergen and checked her luggage at the Bergen railway station. Those are actions you wouldn't expect from a person planning on killing themselves. Getting money and checking bags with a temporary storage service both suggest that you're planning on coming back and going on a journey. More fundamentally, there was no obvious fuel source to get the fire started. Once it was burning, the wick effect could have taken over, as we discussed in episode 149 on spontaneous human combustion, but you need something to get it going. And there weren't any plausible fuel containers at the site. There were no remains of a hairspray can that could have exploded. The small quantity of liqueur that she could have used wouldn't be likely. And although the authorities did find a very small quantity of gasoline on the fur, on the fur hat under her body, there was no container that held gasoline found at the site. And she still had some of the phenobarbital pills in her mouth. She hadn't swallowed them all. If anything, that would suggest that someone forced her to take the pills, but she resisted and tried to avoid swallowing all of them. Then someone poured gasoline on her, set her on fire, and took the container away with them. Professional assassins often shoot, stab, or poison people. Why would an assassin set her on fire in a remote location? 
to obscure her identity. That's something that applies whether or not this was a suicide or a murder. The only reason to burn her body in a remote location would be to make it harder to figure out who she was. The fire itself would make that hard, and the remote location could keep her from being found for a long time, if ever, uh, making identification even harder due to decomposition and predation. If she killed herself, why would Isdalon woman want to hide her identity? Whether she was a criminal or a spy, she had associates in Norway who knew who she was. Yes, but if she just disappeared and her body was never identified, her associates wouldn't know what happened to her. And that could protect her family and prevent reprisals. For example, if her gang or spy ring had an if you quit will come after your family rule. On the other hand, if she was murdered, the killer or killers would not want the body to be identified to make it harder for the authorities to find them. And a fire in a remote location could serve those purposes. Did any witnesses see people in the area who might have been her killers? Possibly. After the initial run of Death in Ice Valley, they came back in 2019 with a special update edition of the podcast. One of the things they reported was that they had found a man named Ketel Keversoy, who says that he saw Isdal woman being followed by two men shortly before her death, and he very much wanted to tell the podcasters what he saw. I had to tell somebody about it, because this tragedy filled me up. I have remembered it good uh, for 48 years. I uh, have always had a need to tell it to somebody. He reports that shortly before Estal Woman's death, he was hiking near Ice Valley. He, he hadn't seen anyone in two hours, but then he saw Estal Woman being followed on the trail by two men who were about 20 meters or 65 feet behind her. And they were not dressed for the cold conditions up in the mountains, but like they should have been dressed if they were down in Bergen. I had been walking for a couple of hours, and finally I saw somebody here. A lady first and two men behind, and they, they were very close, like they should go in the town. Next I saw her, I come closest to her, and uh, I'm thinking she had not enough clothes on. And when we meet, she was very close. Her face was looking at me. And the face, to me, it looks like she was scared and she was giving up. And for me, when I go in mountains, I always say, hello. Everything stopped. The man behind, I met them a little bit further down. And how far behind were they? About 20 meters. Oh, okay. And they not communicated. But the faces was dead. It was wooden face on all. It's not normal. Do you think they were following her or were they with her? No, they were following her. The lady know that they were coming after her. She only looks scared. And when she look at me, I even feel that she started to say something, but she didn't. And then she looked also behind her and see these men, but I'm sure she know they were going after her. What do you remember about their looks? What did she look like? I remember the hair, uh, dark hair going down on the side, not too long, but uh, something. And also the man coming behind uh, had dark hair and was a little bit more brown in the skin than than we are here, but not too much. So you thought they didn't look Norwegian, or? No, they didn't. They, I was thinking uh, South Europe. So he said hello to the woman he thought was this tall woman, and she started to say something back, but didn't, and then looked over her shoulder at the men following her. Everybody froze for a moment before they continued walking. Nobody said anything. The woman looked scared, but resigned to whatever was happening. And the men maintained wooden, expressionless faces. They had dark hair, like the man Istal woman was seen with when buying the mirror. And the men looked like they were from Southern Europe. What did Mr. Kversoy do after this encounter? 
After he read about Istal Woman's death in the papers, he wanted to go to the police, but he was afraid of sounding crazy, so he didn't at first. Eventually, though, he did report it to a friend of his in the Bergen police. He had difficulty stating in English uh, what he was told by his friend in the Bergen police, but here's a translation. What he is telling is that the, the Norwegian police officer, his friend, said that this this case is way beyond our task. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an international case and it's never going to be solved. Yeah, exactly what he say. And that corresponds to what other people told Death in Ice Valley. They heard multiple Uh, stories from people who thought that the Bergen police had been hampered in their investigation from higher authorities, and there was a cover-up to keep the full truth from coming out, and that the press conference that the police held, which effectively publicly closed the case just three weeks into the investigation, was part of that cover-up. Are there reasons to question Mr. Kversoy's story? Well, it is just one man's report many years after the situation. He sounds very sincere, and his story is not at all implausible, given all the things we've heard, but his memory could be wrong. The key difficulty is that he remembers this encounter happening on a Sunday afternoon, and that's a a bit difficult to square with the timeline of Istal Woman's death, since she was seen alive on Monday, November 23rd, which was likely the day of her death. But it's possible that he encountered them sometime before her death, and they later came back to this place, and that's when the murder occurred, you know, the next day or something. Maybe the unexpected encounter with Mr. Kversoy, a potential witness, even caused the men to delay the murder and march Istal Woman back up that trail later on. Or simply maybe Mr. Kversoy is misremembering exactly when the encounter occurred after all these years. But the story itself is not implausible, including the idea of a cover-up. Why would the Norwegian government or intelligence services want to do that? Perhaps because this was a case where there was a lot of international interest. Uh, They'd been contacting Interpol and agencies all over Europe, and the press had taken notice and was reporting on it. Sometimes when a spy or an espionage ring is uncovered, it can be in everybody's interest to pretend this never happened for the sake of national security. Or perhaps it can be in the interest of certain particular people. Death in Ice Valley asked a former KGB agent now living in the West what he thought of the situation. Our former KGB spy Alexander Vasilyev has a theory connected with her movements. She could be a courier because she traveled so much. Because let's say you have a spy interested in the testing field for those uh, penguin missiles. The spy would be living in that area, staying in that area, trying to gather as much information as possible. In this missile test area, she wasn't actually seen trying to enter a boat or something like that. She was seen talking to an officer on the quay. So maybe she was there to pick up information. I think we'll break this case right now. Well, it looks to me like there was an espionage ring operating in that area, possibly involving some uh, Norwegian officials. And she was a courier for that uh, espionage ring. And she did some mistake. They killed her. They put her body on fire. And then they tried to cover up the whole story because some top-ranking Norwegian officials uh, were involved. That's it. And that is a plausible theory of what happened in this case. It's speculative, uh, for example, about high Norwegian officials being involved and shutting down the case to protect themselves. It also could have been shut down for other reasons, including simple bureaucratic incompetence and interagency competition and failing to share information with each other. But it's a plausible theory. So now what can we say about Istal Woman from the faith perspective? If she was involved in a common sort of crime like prostitution or smuggling, 
that's bad. Espionage, though, is in a different category because it can be justified. Uh, whether it was justified in her case will depend on who she was working for and why she was working for them. That's a matter we don't have enough information to evaluate. Obviously, both suicide and murder are grave sins, so that's a serious source of concern. Uh, and by the way, suicide is never the answer. There are always better alternatives, and uh, anytime anybody has thoughts about suicide they, that won't go away, they should get help, and help is available. Also, despite uh, the more than 50 years that have passed since her death, we can still pray for her. As Pope Benedict XVI pointed out in his encyclical on Christian hope, Spes Salvi, God is beyond the earthly reckoning of time, and so it's never too late to pray for anyone. So let's pray for Istal Woman and everyone involved in the case, no matter what their role was. Is there anything we should say before we end? There are a lot of theories about Istal Woman, and you'll find these in some of the resources that we'll be providing links to. In particular, David Morgan's book, Istal Woman, A New Perspective, looks at an interesting theory. His view is that the investigation of the case may have been bungled, and that it was the American woman, Julie Valentine, who may have been confused with Fenella Lork. But as always, I recommend that listeners keep their critical thinking skills alert and examine proposals from all points of view. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Istal Woman? Istal Woman did not die as the result of an accident, nor was she an innocent businesswoman or traveler. Instead, Istal Woman was a spy or a criminal who either committed suicide or was killed, and the evidence indicates that she was most likely murdered and that she was most likely a spy. Probably she was a young, inexperienced spy who made a mistake that led to her death, and this was then covered up afterwards, though for reasons we can't fully discern. By the way, um, I also just happen to note we've got these two mysterious deaths, apparently of spies, Somerton Man and Istal Woman, and it, it, I guess it's just coincidence. I mean, even though Summerton is spelled with an O, I assume it's etymologically related to summer. And then you've Istal Woman is uh, is named after ice, which is cold. So you've got this hot cold thing going on here with the two mm -hmm. mysterious spy deaths. I assume that's just a coincidence. Summer Town Man and Ice Dale Woman. Hmm. Yeah. All right, so Jimmy, what do we have for further resources on this topic? We'll have a link to David Morgan's book, Istal Woman, A New Perspective, Woodward and Bernstein's book, All the President's Men, the Death in Ice Valley podcast and its Facebook page, also an Answers with Joe video on YouTube that covers Istal Woman, as well as articles on Istal Woman herself, and uh, pictures of her, hot of her hotel registration cards, the isotope map of where Istal Woman may have grown up in later childhood, and the photo of Istal Woman on a horse, or who the woman who may be Istal Woman on a horse. All right. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, in episode 202, we uh, we talked about the blue panic orbs of Skinwalker Ranch and the ATIP UFO program that the government has run. So this week we have a kind of an update on that. We've got a UFO theme. First, we'll have a link to a story from the British newspaper, The Sun, about a whole bunch of documents that have now been released through the American Freedom of Information Act that deal with this program and with UFOs, including um, anomalous injuries that people received after encounters with UFOs, um, just like the blue orbs would anomalously injure people. Also, we will have a link to the specific document from the Defense Intelligence Agency that the story is about. It's called Anomalous Acute and Subacute Field Effects on Human Biological Tissue. So you can read the actual government document for yourselves. And we'll also have a link to the Black Vault. Now the Black Vault is a website that archives material that has been released through the Freedom of, of Information Act, including a lot of UFO-related stuff. And they have a specific archive of documents connected 
to the OSAP ATIP UFO program. So we'll have, including the one about injuries. And so we'll have a link to the uh, Black Vault's OSAP document archive. So you can read all the different documents that have been able to be released. Mm. So that's it from us. What did you think and what are your theories about Istal Woman and what happened to her? You can let us know online by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page or sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You can send a tweet to at mys underscore world or brand new, you can join the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord where you can join all kinds of listeners and viewers who can talk about this particular mystery any of the mysteries we talk about or anything related to the show or you can call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515 that's 619-738-4515 by the way, I want to say a special a word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7, who does the animations and video editing for Mysterious World. They do a really great job, so be sure and check them out, especially if you have video editing needs. Also, uh, check out what they do for Mysterious World by going to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And I am trying to grow my channel, so please uh, subscribe and hit the bell notification so you'll always get... Uh, informed whenever we have a new video coming out. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we'll be looking back in time to the dawn of human history and then telling the story of how we discovered the universe. Excellent. Very cool. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World T-shirt, a mug, all kinds of merchandise in our new merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. And you can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>